Okay, so I'm not from Portland, so I'm not speaking with a US accent, but hopefully you guys will uh, forgive me for that. Um, so yes, my name is uh, Jakob Freiling. I'm a DevOps director for the Digital Fast Lane a division of NetBank. Um, and um, the Digital Fast Lane is a, a division of the NetBank all around how do we transform the bank? How do we disrupt the financial services industry? And I'm not, not sure if you guys have seen, end of last year, NetBank launched a new mobile app called the NetBank Money App. And that whole initiative came out of the DFL. So as Adrian also said, you know, I spoke last year about um, continuous testing as being the final frontier of, of DevOps. So since then, I decided to put my money where my mouth is and actually join an organization and try to see if this stuff actually works. So I'm glad to give some feedback today on our journey over the last six months or so on our adoption of, of DevOps. Um, so the first one is really about culture. You know, we cannot, um, we cannot start until, unless we talk about culture as well as one of the, the areas of change that we need to influence in our organizations. So we started a, uh, a concept called NWOW, uh, which stands for New Ways of Working. Um, and we started at the beginning of this year, and it's all about how do we transform uh, NetBank in the process, and how do we go from the, what we call the business as usual to how do we start to innovate as an organization, and how do we start becoming more agile and more disruptive in the, in the industry as well. And also, you know, how can we start to become more client-focused? Um, I spoke to someone this morning who said, you know, they like NetBank because, you know, it's a very security conscious bank. Well, you know, the, one of the problems are that because we're so security conscious, it always took a while to get new innovation now. And we're trying to change that culture now as well. And it's very important to understand as well that from an organization point of view, if you don't have this kind of buy-in at the very top, at the executive level of your organization, you're already going to struggle to get out of the, the starting blocks. Because it's great to say, you know what, we've got a couple of really talented engineers who are doing some great stuff in one pocket of the organization. But if you don't drive that from the very top, you're set up for failure effectively. So it's very important to have that kind of buy-in at the highest level of the organization in order to, to drive this whole cultural change within the organization. So what we also have uh, decided to do is to form our teams based on and hands up where this model comes from, um, the whole idea of <laughs> yes, the whole idea of squads, tribes, and chapters. So basically what we've decided to do is um, we've started to, started to create squads which are like feature teams within, uh, within the organization. And those feature teams will effectively work on particular features, be it uh, on a, a mobile banking platform or, or anywhere else for that matter. But within these um, squads, we're starting to build these self-forming uh, teams um, with our own product owners, uh, business analysts, our developers, our testers, and also DevOps engineers as well within, within these squads. And, and we have quite a few of these squads that we spun up beginning of this year working on, on new, uh, new products and, and, and new innovation. Then also from a DevOps point of view, what we've done is we've sort of created like a two-pronged approach. Number one is we have, if you look at the center of excellence, there's a little beehive, and Joe also had a picture of a bee and a sunflower, so I thought it's like quite fitting. Um, so we have the hive where we basically have a really talented engineers that sits and help figure out how this tool chain should look like from end to end, right? And they're responsible for, for implementing these tools and for, for getting the platform up and running. But then what we also do is we also have DevOps engineers in each squad because we realize that we can't influence the culture unless we actually have engineers on the ground in the squads helping these teams to transform. And uh, we found that very useful because trust me, if you, if you give a developer free reign to do it any way he likes, then 99% of the, the processes that we put in place will probably be thrown out of the door. So it's really important to have these uh, guys in your squads to actually drive the cultural change. Within your, uh, within your organization. So that's sort of what we've, we've ended up um, doing from, from that perspective. And um, if we look at the whole best DevOps philosophy that, that we're trying to, to push within, within NetBank, it's um, really to look at the whole software development lifecycle from start to finish, all the way from planning. For instance, 
Um, our task management system is Jira, and even at that early stages, from a DevOps point of view, we prescribe the kind of workflows that um, the various squads need to adopt. Because by creating those workflows, we can have better control over the integration and the automation and how that fit into our CI CD processes, which I'll also talk about a little bit later on. And the same with continuous integration and continuous deployment. It's about having the engineers on the ground working with the developers. And it's not just about doing it on behalf of the developers, it's actually empowering the developers to be able to do this themselves. So we're really looking at how we can, we can install these principles within these squads to make them all self-sufficient. And then continuous validation, that's the continuous testing part, which I spoke about last year as well in length, and it's also about working with the quality assurance organization of, uh, of the bank to say, what tools are you guys using and how can we um, effectively integrate and automate a lot of the stuff that you guys are doing into the CICD pipelines so that we can start to create um, what we call a zero touch deployment workflow, effectively automating everything from start to finish. And then finally, we've got the monitoring piece to that as well. And also there we look at the kind of tools that we select from a monitoring perspective, how does that fit back into or plug back into the, the, the whole pipeline. So really from a DevOps point of view, the, the, the team are really pivotal in, in trying to establish these principles and these practices within the organization. And it's important to, to have that center of excellence in your organization where you can start to drive this kind of uh, change uh, across the board. So that's a little bit on the, the, the cultural side. Um, so next up, I want to talk a little bit more on the, um, the processes that we've um, adopted along the way. And uh, luckily, we don't let the developers just debug their own code and uh, take their word for it. We have some processes that we put in place to ensure that we get quality on the other end. Um, the first of those, uh, let's start with, with branching strategies, right? Um, so we have a, a trunk-based development branching strategy. Um, so we've sort of morphed it a little bit. You know, it's a little bit of trunk-based and it's a little bit of Git flow as well that we're using. So, so for instance, what we have done or where we deviated sort of from the, the trunk-based development uh, process is uh, we've started creating short-lived feature branches as well. But that allows us to do a couple of things. Number one, it allows the developers to start diving on a separate branch, not impacting our main line or trunk. Secondly, it allows us to write the unit tests. Thirdly, it allows the quality assurance engineers to start automating the, the tests as well. Um, because let's face it, you know, your testing should live with your project and with your code as well. And that gives us the opportunity to do all of that. Once all of that is ready, only then do we merge the, the, the branch back into mainline or trunk. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit later on, all the processes that we go through there. But essentially, we have a couple of quality gates that we put in place to ensure that you know, the code that we're pushing is of the highest standards. Um, and, um, and trust me, it only takes a couple of days for the developer to realize that you know, not writing unit tests is not going to get his code into production faster. Um, and then what we also do is we also started to use things like feature toggles as well. So again, because you're working on mainline, you know, you're not always in a position to push your code into production at, uh, at the click of a button. And again, there we use feature toggles that we can easily switch on and off certain features um, and control what we take uh, into production. Because realistically, if you think about it, anything that sits on your mainline, you should be able to push any time of day, literally. You know, it's, you shouldn't have to wait a week or two weeks or a month to push your code. Uh, theoretically, it should be ready at any given point in time. So then that's what we strive for as well. So the next part of the process that we also in introduced is the whole concept of test-driven development. And really the idea that, you know what, we need to write tests first, then code later. Um, and this is probably one of the hardest things from a developer's perspective because you know, they are very used to just writing code. Um, but again, because of the, the quality gates that we've put in place, it's very difficult for them to get their code onto mainline unless they've written the unit test to test that particular feature or function. 
Um, so it only takes a couple of sprints for them to realize that they're not going to get away and it's probably best to just concede and um, get on board with this. Um, but it works very well because um, a lot of times it also allows the developers to understand the business, um, the business process a lot better because by writing the test you effectively have to think about what you're trying to solve, what's the problem you're trying to solve in this process and by doing that when you start developing, you also find that your development time is much shorter because you understood the problem a lot better from the get-go. So continuous integration. So like I said, effectively what would happen after the developer has um, written their, um, their code, we would um, do a, um, a merge request or a pull request to trunk where it gets peer reviewed. Um, we run through a number of tests. We have um, our continuous integration process built in such a way that, you know, we have uh, pre-commit uh, hooks in, in, our, in our CI pipeline as well. So that, you know, if you don't achieve a certain level of code coverage, your code will not end up on, on, on mainline. Um, and equally so, we run through the full set of regression or unit tests um, as, as part of that CI process. Um, we, you know, we're also starting to, to use containerization from the point of view where we can spin up Jenkins slaves uh, very quickly, um, build uh, our artifacts, test it, do things like static code analysis that we also do in our continuous integration step and only then merge the code onto our main line. And it's very important to understand that continuous integration is sort of your, from a developer's point of view, that last sanity check before you end up on, uh, uh, in your continuous deployment process. Because once it's compiled and approved and it la lands up on trunk, like I said, that code could theoretically get into production today, tomorrow, at any time. So really there has to be a lot of uh, checks in place, all automated, of course. I mean, we, we don't sit there and manually go through each one of the changes, but it's important to have these processes in place because without those processes, we, uh, we um, are basically setting ourselves up for failure. Continuous deployment. Then once, you know, all of that is done and that's ready to, to go, we um, effectively kick off our uh, continuous deployment process. And again, this is very important because this is where the rubber hits the road and this is where we start to understand the quality of our applications and start to understand as we go through all the different test and validation stages how well our code is performing. You know, this is where we do end-to-end -end testing. This is where we do our non-functional testing. You know? um, and at every stage of the process, we have continuous feedbacks that allow us to bring that information back to the developers and back into the squads to understand the quality of uh, the software and, and where we should make improvements. And as an organization, this is probably where we spend a lot of time in terms of, um, you know, Joe also spoke about that status quo, to challenge that all the time is to get the organization to understand that, you know what, we're not being irresponsible. We are actually, um, you know, putting a lot of governance and a lot of checks in place it just means that we can do this at, at pace. You know, we don't take weeks, we can take days or hours even to do this. So uh, to try and have this fully automated continuous deployment pipeline is paramount to, to any kind of uh, digital transformation or, or DevOps type adoption as well, uh, we believe. Cool. So next one, continuous testing. I like that, uh, that uh, comic. You know what, if the tests Fail, just change the assertion on it, and then uh, it's all good. Um, uh, let me not say more. Um, you also get in situations where you, you get people that try to switch off the tests to make the, the test suite pass, but also that is, I guess, where the responsibility, and that's where DevOps engineers become so important in this whole process, because, again, if you let the people decide, let the developers or the testers even decide, you know what, uh, it's crunch time, we need to get this next build out ASAP, you know, I'm just going to switch off the tests. As an engineer, we are those gatekeepers. We are there to ensure that that does never happen. 
And so it's very important to do that. And again, it gives us a fast feedback. You know, I'm, last year I spoke about the, the, this concept of in sprint everything. You know, what your testing shouldn't lag behind your, your development sprints as well. You know, if you, if you plan in your dev within a single sprint, guess what? You need to fully test your, your feature in that same sprint as well. Because if you can have shippable code at the end of a sprint, you can't have uh, a, 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 your, your, your quality assurance lagging a sprint or two sprints behind. Um, so it's really important to build continuous testing into the pipeline uh, from an early stage. And the way we have our squad set up is that we have our quality assurance engineers sit alongside our developers. So as a developer is writing the code, the testers are already writing the, uh, the, the, the tests in their frameworks so that when we hit the pipeline, effectively we have all our tests already uh, ready to go and, and, and effectively testing our application of end to end. So really important to have those practices in place as well. Cool. So that is a little bit about uh, some of the processes that we've put in place um, in the organization. Um, and again, no conversation about DevOps will be complete without talking about tools. So uh, I'm just going to talk about a few things we've done. I mean, the, the, the work we've done, the pipelines we've built, there's probably not enough time today to, to go through everything and explain how we've done everything. But I decided just to pick a couple of bullet points where um, I wanted to share with you guys today. And um, yeah, and I'm happy to have more conversations offline as well, if anyone wants to. So from a continuous integration point of view, we, we use Jenkins as our CI uh, build server. And what you're actually, actually seeing up there is a, is a screenshot of Blue Ocean, which is a, a part of Jenkins. And uh, what I'm actually showing you is our CI pipeline from start to, to finish. So we've broken it up into a number of stages within it. And we're also using the whole um, CI as, as code concept, you know, Jenkins called it a Jenkins file, where you have some groovy uh, scripts that you can develop and bolt your stages uh, in code, which is quite nice because that, again, lives alongside the actual code that the developers are writing. So if we test our application, we know that the, the CI pipeline that we're using is, ex is, is matches up with that particular release or that particular feature that uh, we are currently developing. This whole process, by the way, takes just a little bit more than three minutes. So that is everything from standing up in, uh, a new Jenkins slave to pulling the code from Bitbucket, our source code repo, to compiling the code, running all of our unit tests we have about on this particular project. This is just one particular feature that I'm showcasing today. Um, that we've developed, we're doing over 250 tests. And in every s sprint, we're adding about 30 odd tests to that sprint. So we continuously, as we develop, add new unit tests along the lines as well. And then we have also the, um, oh, by the way, on the bold step, um, it's probably not that ever uh, visible, but we have also integration into Jira as well. So what's nice about it is the fact that we can actually go and pull automatically out of Jira what tasks are the, we working on at this given point in time so that we can start to associate those tasks with the, with the actual bolt as well. And that allows us to understand at any given point in time where every feature in our development backlog is currently sitting, whether it's in, uh, in the bolt stage, whether it's in uh, the QA stage, or whether it's made its way all the way up into production. And we have that linkage bolt between uh, Jira and, and Jenkins, so we can, we can easily pull those kind of metrics. And then on the scanning stage, we have integration with uh, uh, SonarCube. I'm not sure if you, anyone here is using SonarCube. I see a lot of nods in the audience. Um, so we do a couple of things. We have our own quality profiles that we've set up. Um, and again, it's a pass-fail profile, so if you don't meet the requirements, we will fail the bolt and the whole CI process will stop effectively. So we will not allow you to merge unless SonarCube tells us otherwise. Um, so basically, you know, we do things like code smells, we do things like security vulnerability scanning, the whole static code analysis um, component of that. 
And we also pull in our uh, code coverage results from XUnit uh, because this is actually a .NET Core um, application that I'm showing here. Um, and we're pulling those results from XUnit, push it into Sonar Cube, and we are able to see exactly uh, where we stand from a quality perspective. And then once everything is done, we publish it. Then once it's um, in the published stage, what we do is we then effectively create um, our package in, um, so the tools that we use for automated deployments uh, is uh, from a company called Zebia Labs, um, Excel Deploy, Excel Release, Any, anyone uh, using that technology? Uh, maybe worth looking at. Um, I've got Henk at the back, one of my colleagues, he will tell you everything about Zebia Labs that you need to know. Uh, <laughs> So basically, once the package has been registered um, in Excel Deploy, that package is also versioned, by the way. We are then able to start our CD part of our deployment process. So the whole continuous deployment then kicks off. So we automatically go into Excel release, which is sort of the release management component to this uh, solution set. We effectively create a new, they call it a release, but it's really, um, you know, it's, it's, just a, it's just a deployment pipeline that we've created, right? Um, and as you can see then, there's a couple of stages that we have in our uh, XR release process. From a pre-release stage, you know, we have, we do things like, you know, dynamically creating test data. So every time we run a test, we actually have some of our test data sitting in our repo as well. And again, as part of the handoff between Jenkins and an XR release, we actually pass Excel release a list of all the profiles that we're going to test against. Excel release will then take those profiles, create test data for those profiles, inject it into the various points, be it in the database on the back end or creating test uh, user, user data that we will use to, to invoke. Um, it will do all of that automatically. There's no manual intervention at all. Um, then once we're done with the pre-release stage, we then move over to the development stage. So we've got a couple of stages that we go through. Um, and really, you know, everything is about repeatability. You know, uh, dev, E2E, QA, it's all about how can I create predictability and, and repeatability in the process as well. Because by the time I get to QA, I'm pretty sure how this thing's gonna behave, what it's gonna take to release this piece of software into that particular environment. So it's a very important to, to start to foster that, that culture of repeatability. We effectively set up our environment. So we use um, Ansible at the moment, um, but you know, we're looking to, to move to, to Chef perhaps in the future on this. But effectively we rebuild the environment completely every time we do a deployment. And these are on, uh, on Windows machines, by the way. So we effectively set up or our .NET Core framework, we set up all the patches we need, we effectively set up all our certificate uh, key stores, everything is set up um, through Ansible. So we know again that when we deploy into an environment, we're not gonna get a nasty surprise when we deploy and something does not work. We then move on to deploying the, our code itself through Excel Deploy. So we will hand off a task to Excel Deploy to go and take the artifact, stage it onto the server, and then deploy it and I'll talk about that on the next slide as well. And then we have a fully automated uh, regression and functional testing that will then take place at both of those uh, stages, to be honest. Um, and we are starting to use, or we are using BDD, behavioral driven development as well, a lot. So we're using constructs like Cucumber um, and Serenity um, to write uh, our feature files. And the effect of the feature files is, is it's just a nice way to, to, to uh, effectively write the requirement in, in, in a business language that the business can also take a look at and say, yes, I have tested all the different scenarios, positive and negative scenarios, and they can even go and add more scenarios as they, as they like. Because again, as a squad, you know, everyone should have multidisciplinary type, um, you know, traits. So even the business analyst should be able to go and add features in, uh, into a particular, uh, for a particular scenario along the line as well. And then we have a fully automated uh, test run on that. And again, if at any one of these stages, the, the step fails, the pipeline breaks. At that point, we will not allow you to promote that code into production whatsoever. 
Um, now you have an option to either fail the pipeline and start all over again if it's a defect that we've uncovered or if it's something that can be fixed in the pipeline then we will we will make the change in the pipeline and retry that to get it going but effectively you will not be able to take a bolt into production if any one of these steps fail and then we also started to commoditize our performance testing so again traditionally performance testing has been um, exclusive to a part of the organization that just looks at, uh, at non-functional testing and what we're saying is we're not getting rid of them but what we are doing is we're starting to do a lot more of it a lot earlier in the life cycle as well so to give an example you know every time we push a bolt onto our pipeline we do a full performance test and we actually uh, we're actually able to uncover performance defects as a result of this because if you wait too long to do your performance test typically just before go live that's too late to fix these issues right because now you're in the situation of do i delay the go live or do i uh, just go live with known defects in my code by doing this we again shorten that feedback loop between our testing and our developers so uh, actually not so long ago probably a couple of weeks ago we we ran a performance test and suddenly we started getting http error 500s all over the show and it's like in during our functional testing we did not see that it, it, functional tests all pass perfectly great stuff but we kept getting 500s when we run a performance test it turned out that we we had um an, an issue with um with our in-memory cache that we are using and you only pick that up if you put the system under a lot of stress and we were able to remediate those defects very quickly the kind of things that could bite you if you if you don't do this uh, as part of your pipeline and then we have fully integration to chat ops as well the ability to actually push these events and notifications to a slack group we have got a number of slack groups in our workspace where you can see again you know what even down to the level of what JIRA tasks um, are at what stage of the pipeline and where they're currently sitting and we have that integration is, as well. And then from Excel Deploy, won't spend too much time on this, but effectively this is just an example of some of the things that we're doing where we have a number of packages on the top left hand side that we've registered with Deploy and then per environment, what is nice about Excel Deploy is the fact that you can have environment specific uh, what we call dictionaries so if you have configuration files you don't have to go and create a new set of config files per environment you have a single set of config files and it's all um, variable driven so that again you are sure that whatever you push is correct because there's nothing's more annoying than pushing to production just to realize that the, in one of the production config files you missed a colon and as a result of that the application broke at startup so these kind of things uh, eliminate those nasty surprises that could uh, come in um, and then on the right top hand side those are all the steps we go through to deploy as you can see there's actually quite a number of things that happens from stopping the application servers deploying running database scripts etc so it's uh, quite a few things that we do in the process as well great so then last one i want to talk about uh, from a tooling perspective today is uh, performance testing so i spoke about this a little bit earlier and um, as you can, uh, you might have seen on the previous slide in XR release, we have a step called run performance test. So that performance test will kick off a blaze meter test, which is in the cloud. Um, it's actually, you know, you can actually register on their website for a, for a free version of, uh, of the product. And um, we do, like I said, every time there's a new build, we would run through our performance test and give the results back in, uh, in, in a nice UI that allows us to, to sort of track our performance improvement or degradation over time. And on the back of that, what's driving this is an is a open source uh, project called Taurus. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of Taurus. Um, so it's really, really neat because it allows you to, to use um, YAML files to create your performance tests. So you don't have to use it actually uses JMeter under the covers to, 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 to run the actual test, but you don't need to create your tests in JMeter. You can just, in uh, simple YAML files, there's an example there as well, decide, you know what, this is the kind of test I want to run, this is my website I want to hit, this is the concurrency and duration that I want to run, and you can even share data. So the output of one GET request could be used in subsequent 
requests in a particular scenario as well. So it's really powerful. And guess what? These this, uh, YAML files, this in source code repository, along with the code itself. So every time we have to do a, a defect remediation, we can run exactly the same performance tests we did when we went live with that particular feature, which is really powerful. So effectively, just looking at some of the other tools in, um, in our landscape, these are some of the things that uh, we are using um, within, within uh, NetBank at the moment. Now, obviously, some of these tools are still being evaluated, and there's probably more than I've added onto this list today. But it just gives you a sense of you know, the number of tools that, that we leverage uh, today. We're also starting to look at things like Terraform from an automation point of view as well and kubernetes as well so to see if we can't run these workloads in containers rather than than vms for that matter so in closing what have we learned so far so firstly drink copious amount of coffee this whole transformation is not something that's going to happen overnight you know you need to have a lot of patience along the way as well it's not something that you will be able to get done in one sprint or two sprints on a particular project. It's going to take time. But stay the course. And um, as Joe also said, you know, people will start to pick up on, on uh, the positives and what value it brings to the organization. Then the DevOps Handbook by Jim Kim, Jess Humble, and uh, also Patrick Dubois, who started the DevOps Days concept, right? I mean, that book is you know really valuable you know it really teaches you about all the different concepts and what you need to do um when you start off with devops and not sure what where we should start as an organization so thoroughly recommend that to anyone interested and then sell 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 so why sell well the thing here is is that you guys will always have to convince the rest of the organization that devops is a good thing you know and that it will pay off for itself and I feel like we almost, we're the, um, the, the um, consultants, the sales consultants, if you will, in our organizations, because we need to take everyone else on this journey as well within our organization. You know, it's again, great if you can do something in your little world, but how can you get everyone else and start to influence everyone else in your organization to have that same view and also that same uh, frame of mind as well. So again, it takes a lot of selling internally in your organizations to drive DevOps adoption. And then pick a project. You know, too many times I see people in uh, analysis paralysis trying to figure out and plan a year ahead to, and are so afraid to get it wrong. Well, guess what? You are going to get it wrong, right? But again, if you have that executive buy-in at the top, you know, hopefully they will give you some leverage to, to experiment and be able to make mistakes and learn from those mistakes and get better at it all the time. It's, you know, it's, it's, nothing's more frustrating than to hear people talk about they want to go onto this journey, but they're too, too afraid to actually take that first step. And then challenge the status quo. Again, if you're in an organization where there's a lot of legacy systems as well, you're going to find that you're going to get a lot of pushback. You're going to get a lot of people that say, yes, that's great. You want to do that, but we're not ready. Or actually, no, we have a different process that you need to follow. Therefore, you know, we, we won't be able to accommodate you. And it's all about asking those questions, bringing in those teams into this conversation. Say, but why do you do it this way? You know, what is the history behind this? And then to start to challenge those those theories and to better understand why they've done it like that all this time, you know, and to work with them to start to break down those barriers in the organization um, to really get to a point where we can collaborate uh, collectively. And so what if the color is pink, right? Um, so someone in our organization always uses this analogy to say, you know, it doesn't matter whether the color of the product you want to use is blue or pink. Can it do the job? You know, too many times we fixate it on a certain piece of tech and say, we must use this piece of technology. Well, look what's available in the bank or in your organization. You know, if there's something else, then use it. If, that's, if there's more skills in your organization, then go with that particular product. You know, it's, it's, I know we all have biases and we all think certain products are cooler than others, but ultimately what is available and leverage what you've got in your organization is far more important than trying to find all the the best of the best tools out there. And then last but not least, have fun. You know, 
If we can't have fun, then why are we on this journey in the first place? So with that, I wanted to say thank you for listening to me. And uh, I don't know if there is time for any questions or... Can we have two questions? There's a hand there. Um, i bring you the mic. Hi. Oh. Hi. My name is Eddie. Sadly, I'm not an alcoholic. Uh, uh, I think I did hear you say that uh, you want to switch from Ansible to Chef. So I would like to know, is there any particular reason for that? What? <laughs> no comment. <laughs> can, can I answer this one? Um, I, I don't work with Yaku and I don't know his infrastructure. Um, but I was talking to Joe last night and he was saying a lot of, uh, they, they use Chef. Um, and he explained to me, and I think this is a very good summary of Chef versus Ansible. Ansible is very quick and easy to get from zero to something, but it's very difficult to scale that something. Um, I, I don't know if it's public, but. Joe has a lot of machines and it's difficult to scale. Whereas Chef, it's very difficult to get from zero to something, but it's very easy to scale. So even though people compare them often, they are also very different and they have their pros and cons. Now there's also things around security, how Ansible deals with security that we are also you know, not happy with at the moment, looking to change. And then also it's also about the, the, the people in your teams. Like, you know, we, we've got, um, Two very experienced engineers that, that joined us recently and you know they bring with them a wealth of that uh, knowledge and experience as well along the way so again you know what is available in your organization and, and, and leverage that as well yeah. so I was just going to say that'd be a great open space <laughs> <laughs> cool. okay one more quick question uh, my name is Cecil Hill I think this is a difficult question but I thought I'd ask it anyway um, you say you were the DevOps director of NetBank? Of uh, d d the digital fast lane. Okay, how did you get there? You're talking about sell, sell, sell. I mean, first of all, to get that position up at that level of the, of the organization, I think is huge. Um, well, I, well, I ask that because we're trying to get management buy-in at this stage in, in our organization. And it seems like you've, you've started there already. Yeah. Well, yes. Wow. <laughs> Sorry, Yaku. So, so Debbie is the uh, uh, same part of the organization, so I'm sure she has got an answer. I think from a, from a NetBank perspective, um, where Yaku comes from is what we call the digital fast lane. And they're really the, let's test and drive and see what happens. I think NetBank should be very proud of the fact that we've started in DFL and we've subsequently decided that DevOps is actually an enterprise practice. So from that perspective, we've handed, um, sort of DFL's handed over to us as um, more, an uh, more an enterprise practice. So where Yaku and them started off with the testing component, from a NetBank perspective, we're moving towards making sure that we move to every project then has an, a DevOps footprint. So I think where they've tested and we've learned from there, we're actually moving to growing that practice. And I think it's more about the doing than, than how you go, go there. It started from the top down. So from a GD perspective, our executives actually bought into the concept of DevOps. We're running major transformation projects, and we're currently finding that the scaling is really becoming the problem. And now from a NetBank perspective, our view is actually, how do we actually scale this practice? So my role is essentially, how do we grow it and make it a way of life? And yeah, and that's how we're going. And I think it comes from the top down. So it, it, it goes around beating up our executives and really making them understand right from a business perspective, not just from an IT perspective, how important the practice really is. So it's, 
really one day at a time and how many knocks you can actually take from a day-to-day -day basis. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Sorry, Aku, your questions were answered by somebody else. <laughs>